Hey, there I am. If folks could let me know if you can see and hear me okay, and if the screen looks good, that would be great. Awesome to see so many folks on here. And thanks as always to Susan for volunteering to be our moderator today. Hope everyone's well. So let's see. Never quite get used to the three ring circus. Sounds like uh, people are fo folks are hearing me okay. All good on the audio and visual side. So we're off to a good start. The technology gods are smiling upon us. Um, this is great. Now that I'm here, this is going to go well. Uh, it was a bit of a hectic day with classes and such. Um, probably didn't get as organized as I'd like to be in preparing for this, but I've got some stuff to share with you. So I uh, appreciate your patience and your understanding. We'll just do what we can and we'll learn together. Um, and it'll be great. So thanks again, team. Um, let's see. Maybe I could do a couple shout outs here. Uh, Susan will be sure to put her instructions for how she wants to get the questions during the live stream. And then she can aggregate those questions and get those to me at the end. It worked really well last time. I know a lot of you watch Nick Zentner and even my early live streams, we did all caps uh, just to catch my attention. But Susan has a different method of doing that. So if we can just follow her instructions, that would work great for everyone. So we'll we'll do a couple shout outs here and then we'll get started in about eight or so minutes. Um, cloudy and foggy today here in southern Idaho, in case you're interested. It's been warm. We got all that snow about a week or so ago when we had the eruption in Iceland. It was crazy. We had like maybe 15 inches of snow and since then it's warmed up, it's rained and so there's patches of very slushy snow on the ground if you were interested and you maybe weren't. So uh, okay so I'm just going to list maybe some of the places and not so much all the names because it's hard to do all the names too. So uh, more or less from the top uh, Lancashire, UK, London, England, Iceland, uh, Scotland, Dorset, UK, Colorado, Tucson, but someone that's actually in Quartzsite, uh, Tonbridge, Kent, UK, Toronto, Canada, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Melbourne, Australia, Sweden, Orange, Virginia, Southern Vermont, Spain, Sweden, Scotland, Netherlands, Topanga, California, Stockwell, London, Norway. This is just so cool. Like this is just the beauty of technology bringing people together. Holland, Hamburg, Germany, uh, Eagle, Idaho, Ontario, Canada, Lowestoft, UK, Austria, uh, Grutherborg, the Netherlands. I just had a cool idea. Wouldn't it be cool if YouTube had a thing when you do these live streams that a map was up and as people chimed in with where they're from, like a pin went in the map. That would be pretty cool. Um, just a thought there. Million dollar idea for someone at YouTube. Um, that would be really neat. Just to graphically see where we're all from. Saskatchewan, Massachusetts, Maine, France, Wales, UK, Christchurch, New Zealand, Netherlands, Frederick, Maryland, Vancouver, Canada, Lodgepole, Alberta. If I'm missing you, I apologize. There's a lot in here. Wilt Wiltshire, UK, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, Arkansas, Peak District, UK. It's late in Europe, so I appreciate you jumping on with me. Uh, maybe this will help you get to bed, though. You know, just a nice, just monotonous geology lecture. That'll put you right to sleep. Uh, Cologne, Cologne, BC. I should know how to pronounce that. I probably butchered that. Um, let's see. Dracut, Massachusetts. Hopefully I said that okay. Central New York. Uh, anyone else? Isle of Man, UK. That's cool. Yeah, English Lake District, Copenhagen, Denmark, Alabama, Finland, Sacramento, California, Montana, Arkansas, Eastburn, South Coast, UK. London calling. What's up? Um, let's see. Sound up, please. Am I loud enough? Is it okay? I can turn the sound up a little bit. Let me bump it up just a skosh here. Maybe that helps. Um, 
Cheshire, UK, Cripple Creek, Colorado, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Netherlands, New Hampshire, Hamburg, Germany, Harlem, the Netherlands, Missoula, Montana, Texas, Hampshire, UK, Dalwalunu, Western Australia, Fairbanks, Alaska, where it's negative 35, yikes. Uh, the Nicoya Peninsula, Costa Rica, Northwest Costa Rica, been there, great place. Aberdeen, Washington, Sydney, Australia, Belgrade, Serbia, Austria, Spain, Belgium, New Zealand, Maryland. It just keeps coming. Can he keep up? Maybe. Probably not. Uh, now he lost track of where he was, so he missed a couple spots. Here we go. Belgium, New Zealand, Maryland, UK, Nova Scotia, Canada, Ontario, Iceland, Akuyeri, uh, Manchester, Sweden, Nashville, Vermont, Canada. This is we could just do this the whole time, right? Sheffield, UK, Greece, uh, Rockus to sleep. Yeah, I can do that. Washington State. Are my kids on here? Because that would definitely put them to sleep. Oregon Central Coast, Leeds, UK, Norway. Costa Blanca, Spain, very nice. Atlanta, Switzerland, Michigan, Florida, Texas, Iceland, Germany, Bulgaria, Pennsylvania, New Zealand. It almost sounds like a song. Northern Kentucky, Ontario. Uh, okay, so hopefully the sound's good. Uh, I'm losing. I lost the battle. Sorry. Um, I lost the fight. Darn. Okay, so we've got maybe one more minute. So I think I'm pretty well caught up on everything here if i didn't get your shout out sorry a couple more i'm just seeing switzerland netherlands oklahoma victoria australia western new york state louisiana sicka point scotland um more from iceland denver colorado the faroe islands wow athens greece zurich switzerland four corners new mexico denmark scotland maine we're from all over the place we've uh somehow I have no idea how it all happened, but we've somehow cobbled together this geologic community um, based on a lot of my very silly, primitive, but slowly maybe getting better geology videos. So thanks again for joining me. We'll go one more minute and we'll be good to go. So Susan's our moderator today. Um, and so she will be running the show on the live chat. So if you guys can kind of follow her lead on things. She'll provide some information there about how you can ask questions to me that we'll answer at the Q&A. You can see sort of the rundown of what we're going to cover there on the screen. We'll start with our update on Iceland. Talk briefly about the China earthquake. I don't have, you know, like a monumental amount of information there, um, but talk a little bit about it. It was a pretty big news event when it hit, uh, I guess it was yesterday. And then a quick announcement on something that's happening on February 4th that I know some of our viewers will get excited about. And then we'll do the live Q&A. As always, if you can hit the little thumbs up like button on the screen, that's great. Um, make sure the little bell icon in the top right corner that you've hit that. That'll make sure that you're subscribed and you get notifications and such. Um, obviously, spreading geologic education is my passion. It's what I do professionally. It's obviously now what I'm doing kind of on the side through YouTube. Um, and it's just great to reach out to so many folks. So we'll go ahead and get started. It's about three o'clock on my watch. So thank you all for joining me for this live stream episode. My name is Sean Wilsey. I'm a geology professor here in Southern Idaho. And we have a variety of topics we're gonna look at today. Thanks for learning and watching with me. Appreciate it. Um, just a little bit of background here. I'm learning right there with you. Uh, sure, I have degrees in geology, but I'm learning and reading papers and trying to better myself through learning more about specific processes or locations or different geologic events. So it's fun for me to um, disseminate what I'm learning with you. And then, of course, I hear back from many of you viewers in various ways, and I learn from you as well. So it's great that we have this outlet and this community here. So excellent awesome okay um let's see i'm gonna kind of move away from the live chat which can be all too consuming and turn to my slides here so we're going to start with our update from iceland and in a nutshell i'd say that what's happening in iceland is we have entered the um basically a place with iceland where 
we're kind of expecting anything to happen any day now, right? I think that from now through the next two or three weeks, I'd say we're in the range of like something big could could go down uh, at any point. We've, we're a few weeks or maybe not even a few weeks yet, but we're 10 days or so since the last eruptive event. Um, there isn't like huge monumental data to look at, but there's some interesting trends here. I've got a little diagram I put together that might help some of you that might have struggled with the, the Grobin thing. And we looked at some maps uh, in the last update or maybe the previous one. So I, I've got some other things to present there as well. But let's start with the earthquake data. Uh, over the last 24 hours, very small earthquakes in terms of magnitude. Um, nothing above a two, I don't believe, in this region. Nope, they're all below magnitude one. Um, and in watching the earthquakes over the last couple days, it might be me. I didn't spend a whole lot of time looking at it, but my my impression was there was a very slight shift in earthquake locations a little bit further west. And I, I don't want to hang my hat on that per se, but I, it it could just be the way I kind of recall things but you know you've got the the major road there and of course we've seen a lot of earthquake activity along this northeast southwest trend where this magma intrusion uh, was or is and also where now we have these uh, these faults we actually have faults in these grobins these depressed down dropped regions that run right into town and so we had been seeing a lot of earthquakes there of course we saw some further to the north during the December eruptive event and again it might be me but I just feel like I've seen a few more dots west of the road there um, not ready to say it's anything significant um, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone else has spent some time with it looked at the numbers and saw that there was some percentage of uptick in seismic activity in and around this area so again not much in terms of seismic data we don't see any seismic um, indication that magma is pushing into any new region. If we see that, if that were to happen, what we would expect to see is a uptick in earthquake numbers, possibly an uptick in earthquake magnitude, and we're not seeing that just yet. So for all we, and we'll look at the GPS data in a second, but the magma doesn't seem to be in any large manner shoving itself or pushing its way or forcing its way into some new region uh, around the town of Grindavik. So there's a little bit of our earthquake data looking at it from the perspective of the uh, locations here with the Met Office one. Their, their maps, you know, it covers a big area, so it's hard to see all these dots here. But the one I like to look at, sometimes it's helpful to look at this lower plot here, which shows the last 48 hours and just the actual number of earthquakes over that time period. And you can see there's you know sometimes some uptick, sometimes you can see little clustering events. You can see sometimes lulls in earthquake activity, which are sometimes real and sometimes are related to weather and the seismic instruments ability uh, to distinguish between you know heavy winds and storms and actual earthquake activity. But um, nothing alarming there, just kind of, you know, the earthquake's kind of humming along at fairly low levels. We got maybe, I don't know, 8 to 10 or so above magnitude 1. But again, nothing too alarming when we look at the, at the earthquake data. Uh, if we look at the, we look at the GPS data, and I do want to spend a little bit of time with this. So, and I'll make sure these links are always in my video description. Uh, for each update I do. So there, we have our map here of the different GPS stations. I've more or less transcribed most of those, the important ones anyway, over to my GPS, or excuse me, to my Google Earth map. So we can look at those there if you'd like. And we've been looking at several different stations. Let's start with the the Svartsengi station. So this is the GPS station located right at the power plant. Uh, again, if you're new to these plots, these are a series of three graphs. The first graph is going to show this location, this GPS station's movement over time in a north-south component. So as it goes above zero or if it just trends upwards up on the graph, that's 
the station moving to the north if it were to trend downwards like this one dot here that would be a southward movement so you can see overall steady northward movement uh, the big jumps in the data are the three big dates we've been focusing on so far November 10th when we saw uh, the magma intrusion push to the west excuse me to the east and form uh, a dike which did not erupt the December 18th event which did result in an eruption and then the January 14th event which also resulted in eruption. The second graph shows the movement of the GPS station in an east-west direction. So east is positive values, west is negative values. So anytime you see the data drop down on this graph that would be movement to the west and so steadily we've seen a big drop here to the west and then you can see it sort of stair-stepping down with each um, each one of these signature and uh, big geologic events. And then the last plot is up down motion of the GPS station, which we have spent a lot of time with, but I believe in my last update, we spent a little more time digging into the, the lateral or east, west, north, south components of motion. So here is the location moving upwards over time, which we interpreted as magma being intruded into the subsurface and then it dropping on November 10th as some of that magma moved off to the east. So this location near the power plant dropped in elevation, but then after that moment, it steadily rose, uh, culminating with the December 18th eruption. And then interestingly, and we talked about this a little bit last time, even though we have the January 14th eruption, uh, which pretty much is just the one dot there, we didn't see the down drop here. And so uh, there's several interpretations in terms of why why has the elevation at the power plant, which is presumably the closest GPS station above the sill, which is the horizontally oriented magma body, why have we not seen a down drop in the data there? Uh, and one, one possible interpretation would be, well, that when the magma was erupted, that was magma maybe already off in the storage system. So you didn't really lose any of the magma supply beneath the power plant, that was just a smaller eruption of magma that was already in the plumbing system off to the east. And if you look at the eruption from January 14th, it was the smallest uh, of the two most recent eruptions. And even comparing it to the 2021 to 2023 eruptions at the system to the east at Fagardalsfjat, um, it was much smaller than those as well. So you can see here um, a little bit of an uptick over the last couple of days. And then since then, it's you know, there's a slight increase, but it's it's somewhat stalling. The the rate of deformation in terms of uplift seems to be slowing down to some degree. Uh, so that's Svart Sengi. If we look at one of the stations off to the west, uh, the Eldvorp station, and we kind of focus here mostly on the uplift. So here's again, November 10th, December 18th, January 14th. This one has a little bit more um, I think it's a little better behaved, at least so far. You can see that for the most part, especially the last two events that were eruptions, it reached more or less the same elevation um, and then it erupted. So it, it, it crept up to a little bit over 60 millimeters or so of uplift. And then that was the breaking point, at least at this one station, to cause the eruption. And so you can see it again here on January 14th. And notice where we're at now at this specific station is we're, we're still a couple centimeters shy of that threshold, um, but it's still moving upwards in that location. So um, so there's those two stations. I don't, we'll spend maybe a little bit of time coming back to, we'll come back to this, I think, in a little bit, perhaps. But I wanted to show you, we went over this to some degree a few weeks ago, and this is from the Met office. And so they put this out, I think maybe maybe late last week. And what this shows is the town of Grinovic. So this is a map. Um, the gray is the lava field. So this is the January 14th lava field, the, the main flow field here. The smaller one down in this area where uh, the three homes were actually destroyed. Uh, and then the big picture here, well, two things is one, it shows in red. So the red lines, you can see two sets of red lines here. These are the bounding faults for this Western Graben. So everything between these two red lines um, sank a bit at some point. This is, goes back to the November 10th 
uh, events. So this was a downdropped region around November 10th. And then on January 14th, the area developed another Graben shown here by these orange, these two parallel or nearly parallel orange lines here. Um, so this would be the downdropped area of this eastern Graben. So we have a western Graben over here between the two red lines, another one over here. They do overlap in, in an interesting way. And then there's a region in between them here, right in town, right near the main intersection in town, where the, uh, between the two Graubens, this is an area that's still elevated a little bit. I'm going to turn to a cross section here in a second and show you what this looks like, because I, I, I wondered how, how clear this was to folks um, maybe if you're new to geology and all these maps and such. So I wanted to present it in a, in a little bit easier to digest format. And then the last thing I want to mention about this map, which is very uh, rich in terms of detail, has a lot of good data, is the colors. So these different kind of cold and warm colors correspond to uplift versus downdrop, downdropped areas. So in blue, in this graben here, the eastern graben, you can see that it's sunk uh, in places, you know, maybe as much as three meters or so overall. And well, it's actually not that, that deep blue. I guess it's a lighter blue, so it's it's less than that. Um, yeah, this just shows the total ground movement at any given point up or down. Um, and some of these deeper pits here might be from some of the quarry activity and such. So let me switch over to my cross section then and see if this helps a little bit. So this is super simplified, but this is west to east across the area and so more or less the area that we're looking at here would be uh, maybe a line across uh, Grindavik that would maybe look something more or less like this so maybe a line across this area so we're going to cut across this area from west to east and cut across those two grobbins with the, this little diagram here. So I just wanted to show you what these look like. So here's the area that's down dropped on the western part of town. And if I got these numbers right, and if I don't, uh, I apologize, but I believe there was as much as about 1.6 meters of subsidence or ground sinking, if you will, in that area. And then the eastern grobbin is not quite as deep, maybe only about uh, you know 0.6 meters over here. But then you have a little chunk of ground in town that's still somewhat elevated. So when we talk about these fractures in town and the cracks and all the uh, the the dangerous things in town, this is sort of the the very superficial, simplified geology that's going on there. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful to see. Um, what that looks like. So if those grobbins and things were a little vague or nebulous or those were new terms to you, I, I just wanted to put something simple up there that, that explains it in a little bit more detail. And in geology, when we have an uplifted block that's bounded by faults, in this case, these are what we call normal faults, uh, that's called a horst. Um, apparently, these are derived from uh, German words, which we've had discussions about in the past. So, so hopefully that was helpful to some degree. Um, and you can actually come in here on my Google Earth image, and if I throw in, so now I'm going to add the grobbins. So there's the two grobbins there. Um, let me get rid of the ruler. So the light blue kind of teal grobbin is that western one. So there's the two faults that bound it. And then there's, in blue, I've got the eastern grobbin. So I've added some my, my Google Earth is just getting more complicated, um, but the nice thing is you can take these on and off, make them disappear. Uh, and then if we add the, the GPS stations, you can see where some of those plot up within this. And so sure enough, if you go to this specific GPS station, AUSV, you'll see actually the downward movement that's taken place there um, since the last eruption or two. So those are kind of helpful. So um, yeah, so that's uh, some of what I've been spending a little bit of my time with and let's see so okay so that's um, most of the science update there really hasn't been a whole lot the Met Office hasn't had an update since last week um, there's not a whole lot to discuss in terms of good hard uh, science and data there um, so one of the questions that keeps coming up and I get either emails from folks or you know just it just I see it on discussions in other places is 
is there magma under the town which would appear you know you've got these two fissures that opened up very close to town let me take the grobbins off to make it a little bit clear um, and this one that was very close to town but is there actually magma beneath the homes and businesses uh, in Grindavik and I would say it's not likely and here's my reasons why we know that the town has a lot of fractures cracks in the ground we've seen that we already had one unfortunate incident where a worker fell into one of the cracks um, his body as far as I've heard so far was never recovered presumed dead um, so we have this dangerous scenario with lots of cracks in the town um, but I think that and a lot of these cracks formed the whole area became dangerous and the whole situation escalated to a new level on November 10th when we had the magma intrude to the east um, forming and at the time I was reporting this as well I don't know if I still have the um, I don't think I still have the maybe I do have it oh yeah so if you remember this I, there was updates um, you know months ago where the Met Office had put out a map and this big orange line on my Google Earth image there more or less indicated the the length and location of where this magma body was thought to be um, and at the time we even hypothesized a little bit about well what would an offshore eruption look like and how explosive would that be and would that be better or worse for the town um, if you've been with me that long you remember all all those discussions that we might have had at that time in thinking about it some more and in the weeks since um, I just don't think there's really good evidence for any sort of magma right under the town for one um, you know we've got these cracks that have opened up in town there has not been any heat coming out of them other than just the regular you know the the ground is warmer than the cold winter air in Iceland so there's no appreciable amounts of heat coming out of them and if these cracks were linked to these dikes and vents over here you'd expect to see some some heat coming out of them you'd expect also to get gas coming out of them volcanic gases so as the magma body stays underground and it loses gases into the rocks and those gases then will rise they'll follow the fracture systems wherever they are um, and so the magma would be degassing the whole time and to my knowledge again there's no evidence that we have volcanic gases degassing anywhere in Gurindavik and then another thing is that we have a lot of these fractures at least a couple of them that were close to the coast along the shoreline here some of these fractures actually were connected to the ocean they actually saw they were filled with seawater they they rose and fell a bit with the tides and if there was magma in some of those fractures that were interacting with seawater we would have seen a lot of steam coming out of some of these cracks we would have seen you know possibly explosive behavior but for sure we would have seen steam coming out of those cracks and so I think what maybe has happened is the magma was for sure injected over into this region we have an eruption here in, on December 18th we had another eruption here on January 14th but is there convincing and compelling evidence that 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 conduit of magma which probably isn't very wide the dike has not been measured I haven't seen any data but I would guess it's less than 10 feet 3 meters in width it's probably not a very wide body and there's nothing to suggest that it actually had has propagated underneath the town now that can all change um, but I just wanted to kind of put make that point and that's totally my opinion that's just what I think is going on but there's just no data there's no hard evidence for that so the cracks and the fractures we see are more or less related to the tectonic activity and so again these these grobbins right these fractures or faults that run through the town those are actually um, driven by the extension this is a sitting on the plate boundary the plates are moving apart in a east-west or maybe slightly northwest southeast direction and so um, the cracks are more likely related to that so it seems to be more tectonically driven and the magma is taking advantage of these new fractures and cracks and invading them and you can see that plots up pretty nicely I mean this grobbin uh, lies right on top of this southern fissure that destroyed the three t the three houses and the upper fissure vent um, is very close to and quite parallel to the 
the eastern border of the west or excuse me yeah the eastern border of the western graben if that kind of makes sense um, and then even this this one here a continuation feeds a little bit into and is pretty close to parallel to uh, the December 18th eruptive event so um, hopefully that adds some clarity or maybe like me it just you know the more you think about it the more confusing things get remember too as we move forward that we won't have an eruption until the excess pressure in the magma driven by its volume driven by the gas content uh, driven by its buoyancy until that pressure in the magma exceeds the strength of the overlying rocks we're not going to have an eruption and so we're watching the gps we're watching the earthquakes but that's really so the question you know when is the next eruption going to take place well the the best answer we could give that no one would find satisfying of course would be when the magma pressure exceeds the strength of or pressure if you will of the rocks that are containing it so remember we have this horizontal sill sills are for storage so magma is being pumped into that sill from depth and then as that sill pressurizes some of that magma moves off into some direction and fills um, vertical conduits which are dikes and dikes are for transporting magmas for so sills are generally considered storage features and dikes are fundamentally considered um, uh, transportation features in order to get that material up to the surface um, let's see okay so I do have a, another diagram I've been reading uh, oh I forgot to put the, the reference on here but I'll put it in the the video description I've been reading my volcano tectonics book um, and this figure also might help a little bit too I wanted to also point out how complicated these dikes are or can be in terms of as they move upwards it's not as simple as just a pipe or a chimney cutting through the rocks above it remember in Iceland we have a whole series of rocks of different different types so even though it's all fundamentally in this area a rock known as basalt there's basaltic lava flows there's other dikes and sills in the subsurface made out of this same composition of material there is basalt that had erupted underneath glaciers um, that produces a, a, a fancy but it's still basalt but a, a bunch of tephra and material called hyaloclastite there's pillow basalts there might be layers of ash there could be soil horizons between lava flows um, there could be intrusions of magma so rather than extrusions or lava flows there can be intrusions so my point is that the, in the in the five kilometers from the magma body to the surface there could be hundreds of discrete different layers each of which has a different density each of which has a different degree of fracturing each of which has different degrees of porosity or pore spaces from gas bubbles and other features there are just so many variables there so as the dike moves upwards um, there's just so many different things that can happen the dike may just totally stop if it encounters a very stiff uh, strong layer above it so that would be what we call like an arrested dike or a terminated dike um, the dike may come up and be deflected along the contact between two layers um, but it might just move in one direction so that would in this case they're calling that a, a single deflection or it might come up and move laterally in both directions double deflection or assuming that it has the pressure or strength to move into the next layer or maybe the next layer above is is relatively weak then you can see that it actually does penetrate uh, and push through that that layer right there so all sorts of different variables there um, just like anything I think in my mind you know many years ago when I was taught this stuff it was like oh yeah it's just like you know it's just a crack and then the lava just magma just pushes up through the crack easy peasy no problem and then of course as you learn more and you get deeper in the weeds everything gets more complicated you realize how many variables are at play all the nuances that might uh, dictate this so every little diagram I've tried to draw is an incredibly simplified version of this we'll, we'll likely never know the intricate magma pathway that's taken place here but what we can do in places is go to old exposures 
that have been eroded away cliff faces and see what the dikes and sills and the pathways look like and that's where all this data comes from this does not come from directly observing magma as it's penetrating and intruding rock this comes from studying older completely solidified um, you know past eruptive events and looking at the geometries and some of the structures there so um, okay so hopefully that helps a little bit just another little diagram there again I'll make sure I put the reference for this this is not my diagram this is uh, the volcano tectonics book I guess I could show it to you real quick um, in the camera there can you guys see that okay so August Gudmundsen volcano tectonics right there uh, Cambridge University Press so if you want another book for your for your uh, library then you've got one right there okay so let's switch to um, I don't have a lot of news items either from Iceland uh, our good friend in Iceland and uh, Grindavik resident Amanda Jo uh, took a couple days break uh, and I was fine with that she just needed a little downtime from dealing with eruption news and insurance payouts and what's going to happen to Grindavik she she just needed a little space away from that and I wanted to respect that uh, she's taking a break and really to be honest I went and went through the news uh, sites that I knew and looked for any important news over the last few days really didn't find any uh, I think you know we're in we're into I guess phase four I suppose of this this area and this geologic unrest so maybe we're getting a little bit used to it or you know maybe we're, we're aware that it's this you know we're just in this part of the cycle that that's going on where we're just like everything's ramping up and we're just sort of anticipating the next eruption uh, whenever that may be so it wasn't a whole lot of news to report to you other than the Blue Lagoon is open again um, of course that's a controversial decision but the hotel I believe also the restaurant if not it's opening soon uh, but they're pretty much business as usual and that may be their their model moving forward they may just be vacillating between um, you know opening opening up during these lulls in eruptive activity and, and geologic um, you know some sense of geologic stability and then when things really ramp up and it looks really dire shutting down maybe the eruption occurs uh, and then reopening when when the lava has stopped flowing and things look safe again that may be their new um, sort of business model moving forward but I did Amanda and I Amanda Joe and I did message back a little bit and I did she did say this and I think she would be fine with me sharing this with you um, her feeling about the whole situation in the town and I think she echoes the sentiments that a lot of residents would have is I feel like a lot of residents would just want to they're just tired of being in limbo they just want some sort of closure to this episode that's now about to stretch into its fourth month um, and if that means lava wiping out everything well at least that that story has an ending right rather than this the situation they're in where well you still have a house you still have property so you can't quite you know maybe get reimbursed for that and it, it's just this this waiting and this back and forth and so I think they just want closure and again it reminded me of um, another situation and so I want to take you quickly to uh, a different part of the world um, and maybe rehash a little quick story here that some of you might be aware of um, and some of you maybe not so much um, but an area here in the Pacific on the Big Island of Hawaii which as you well know is a another active volcano um, and there was at one point in this area we'll get in a little closer here and I'm not going to rehash like all the uh, the geology and the ins and outs that would just take too much time that would be a, a an hour or so lecture um, but once upon a time not that long ago let's get a nice picture here here we go so here is the eastern tip of the Big Island of Hawaii and this little this is the Kapoho tide pools right here this little kind of cove great place to just hang out by the water snorkeling and you can see all the houses and this little community that was built around here um, you know a couple hundred homes here I don't have the exact numbers in front of me um, but this area 
this was a, this this image here is from February 2018 but a few months after the satellites took the, this photo uh, everything changed so by April there were eruptions um, not just here but further up in this little subdivision in this area called Leilani Estates uh, unfortunately everyone in this area lived on top of what's known as the east rift zone of Kilauea which had not been active for decades but became active uh, in 2018 and so by by summertime of 2018 um, the eruptions had begun and by the time those eruptions ended the area looked pretty much like this and maybe I can find a little better uh, imagery here oh, maybe that's the best one there um, but you can see the the little community and the little tide pool area there just totally gone there it is before uh, and there it is of course after just completely blank slate there is no for the most part no remnant of any of the homes to some degree just completely wiped out back up here in Leilani Estates some of the homes survived or just happened to be good luck in terms of where the vents opened up in the neighborhood others just completely uh, wiped out and I was there for this eruption it was pretty incredible went back this last May with students we stood the highway's been rebuilt we stood right here and I actually have a video of this on my youtube channel uh, right along this highway of this lava channel this was this was a river of lava that was just incredibly impressive its width its temperature um, we flew over it in an open helicopter when it was erupting and from you know 2,000 feet above it or I don't know what the elevation was from a thousand to two thousand feet or 300 400 meters above it you could still feel the heat uh, and this was the lava flow that just poured out went around and partially filled this older cone here and just completely devastated this coastline it actually pushed the coastline out a little bit you can actually see it added added real estate and land to the edge of uh, the island here so pretty incredible eruption historic but I bring that up only to make the point that at least in this situation these residents had you know this thing started I believe in late April by May um, it was pretty much full on by June if I remember my sequence of events right and by June the lava was pouring down into the sea here so they only had a couple weeks of not knowing how things were going to play out uh, and then the whole thing was over just after a, for, a, sh a short few months um, and of course you know some people had their homes still intact some people lost their homes completely um, and it was devastating to this community it's still I think they, they still bear the scars on that um, to some degree some people that lost their homes there and to me it's just a really interesting comparison to what's happening uh, in Grindavik where we have you know possibly the same thing that may play out but but now you're just left with this well what's going to happen next you know and the difference in Hawaii too I suppose to some degree is those homes that were inundated by lava they didn't have big cracks in the ground their, their community wasn't deemed unsafe it was just at least at, near the tide pools around Kapoho in, in Leilani Estates there were some cracks that opened up um, but for the most part it was just lava's coming and it keeps coming and then it takes out the community whereas here we have you know just so many different things um, th that are big issues here right we, we've got, we've severed uh, or this the pipeline was severed the electricity was severed uh, by the flow field on January 14th um, just a really difficult situation I, I and people have asked me well what would you do what would be your opinion I don't know I would want to sit down with I don't have a clear answer I think you need to listen to these people I think um, you know the government if the government can can make the situation right if we can find a situation where people can relocate and but maybe we leave some of this open like maybe we shouldn't have people live here but possibly the port and the harbor and some of the infrastructure and businesses can continue to operate just like the Blue Lagoon is operating maybe that's the best situation moving forward but it's such a tricky situation so um, I hope I addressed that well I hope I gave that some some clarity and some sensitivity but I, I see some some parallels to the situation that happened in 2018 in Hawaii I also see that there's a couple of differences there as well so 
Um, okay, so that's, I think, all I have for Iceland. Let me turn our attention to the earthquake. Um, well, that's not a good way to start. Okay, here we go. So here is the USGS, and this shows the last week all earthquakes. Um, now, this is skewed a little bit. I don't know how many of you look at these this website, but this is the USGS earthquake um, plotting site and notice there's a lot of earthquakes in the US but that's because we have access we have our own seismic network so this is gonna plot up very small earthquakes like there's a 1.4 in southern Utah and here's a 1.7 in Colorado so this because we have our own seismic network this can detect very small earthquakes and plot them on the map when it comes to global quakes they need to be of a specific of a size that we can actually detect them um, so because we don't share, it'd be wonderful someday if we have a global seismic network and all countries share their seismic data freely, all that, all those seismometers are integrated, that would be really cool. But for now, uh, we don't have that. Notice it shows, you know, no earthquakes in uh, Iceland. And of course, we just saw that there's, there are some there. It's just not detecting these very small ones. So, but anything above a four or so usually um, can be detected from, from, remote distances and then plotted up uh, and shown on these so there's a 4.8 but the one we're looking at the one that happened um, I guess late Monday night technically Tuesday at like 2 a.m. local time is this earth earthquake here in western China right near the border with Kyrgyzstan and so this was a 7.0 earthquake and so you can see a lot these were mostly aftershocks but if we get in there we can find the biggest circle that's the 7.0 um, and so that's the location of the earthquake and just wanted to share with you some of the more or less the the data the science of what happened you probably picked on some picked up on some of this on whatever news feed you get but it was a 7.0 the depth of the earthquake was about 13 kilometers so that's maybe what eight eight miles or so down um, 7.0 which is pretty good size but it's normal, right? Like we probably get 15 magnitude seven earthquakes on planet Earth in a given year. Some years are a little bit more than that. Some years are a little bit less than that. Um, thankfully, it was not a a hugely fatal earthquake. There was only at, at last report I've seen there's only three deaths reported. About 100 or so buildings that were collapsed. A lot of injuries, but the fatality number was quite low. Um, when you click on the earthquake in the USGS that brings you to this other page I was on and you can get lots of good information here and one of the things you can see here and I know some of you will love this is the good old beach ball so these remember the the focal mechanism solutions or sometimes they're called fault plane solutions but these are instructed because these show us what kind of fault generated the earthquake so with the with the blue region which is compression in basically the center of the circle that tells us that this fundamentally was a reverse fault so it was caused by compression it was caused by one side being pushed up and over the other side and the fact that we see the sort of x pattern there um, it's not in the center but it's not all the way on the edge of the circle that tells us that it also had a component of sideways motion or what we call strike slip motion so this would be a reverse or an oblique reverse fault or a re reverse oblique fault so it, it moved it moved by compression up and down but it also had a side to side component of motion as well um, there's been I think I saw a little over a thousand or more aftershocks but that's to be expected whenever we get an earthquake of this size uh, the aftershocks should come and there's likely way more than this remember this is the USGS data reporting so we're only seeing the big ones 5.6 5.2 4.9 uh, undoubtedly there's lots of smaller aftershocks that would go on this map um, but because of the distance and we don't have seismic instruments in this area uh, we don't know you know how many of those are but the, undoubtedly the Chinese and maybe other nations are monitoring how many of those um, how many of those earthquakes and aftershocks have taken place so so the good news is it happened in a pretty um, largely uninhabited region. Uh, these are, there's big mountains here. In fact, let me take you to it on Google Earth because that's always fun. Um, 
and maybe let's see it let's put on oh it's going to zoom us way in so the let's see where's it at there we go so there's the location of the i don't want the roads there we go location of the earthquake and so zooming back out a little bit you can see let's zoom way out here so here's india um, here's china kyrgyzstan and really what's caused this earthquake this is a region known for earthquakes if you look at just the rocks on the satellite view you can see the a lot of these mountains trend east westish across this region if you come into this area in front of the mountains here you'll even see that there's um, just layered rocks most likely sedimentary rocks that trend east to west as well um, so these rocks have been folded there's probably lots of uh, faults in here, reverse faults or thrust faults. And all of this region, uh, the geology here is dominated by the compression or the convergence as India continues to slam into Asia. So as along this convergent plate boundary, which gives us the Himalayas, as India continues to collide with Asia, not only does that push up the Himalayas and generate earthquakes in this region, um, and the whole Tibetan plateau is elevated, but even distant from this quake, back here where this earthquake just occurred, um, you can see these mountains, and this is all related to that event. So this is all um, a common tectonic origin, even though we're quite distant from the actual um, plate boundary itself. So hopefully I made, I made that clear. So this earthquake uh, is what's responsible for this earthquake was is the collision between India and Asia and I did see somewhere that they've they've had earthquakes of this magnitude in the past I think the last one was in maybe the like 40 50 years ago um, but they're to be expected so um, anything else on that oh one other thing on this earthquake was and this is a nice little graphic here I didn't spend enough time on it um, but this shows some of the faults in red the bullseye pattern here is the intensity level of the earthquake so we measure earthquakes remember two different ways one is magnitude that is measured from the seismic waves how much you know if you've ever looked at a seismograph that looks like a, a cardiogram with the little lines going up and down the bigger the deflection the bigger the earthquake in terms of the energy it releases so this is a quantifiable number 7.0 magnitude um, that we can glean from seismic data. Intensity data is a little bit different. It goes to how was the earthquake felt? How much shaking occurred? And this is related to um, the subsurface, like what kind of rocks or sediments are in the area that was being shaken by the earthquake. Was it granitic bedrock? Was it a big sedimentary basin filled with sand and mud? Also has to do a little bit with the building the construction styles of the region are we looking at like brick and cinder block buildings are we looking at steel frame constructions wood frame construction um, it has to do with a little bit how long the shaking lasts so the longer the earthquake caused strong shaking you'd expect there to be more damage so this is more of a qualitative measure based on um, other considerations other variables damage maybe human responses to the earthquake um, things like that. So a really helpful, let me grab a quick drink of water here, but a really helpful graphic here that I think um, uh, shows a lot of what took place here in China. Sweet. Um, hopefully that was helpful. So, but yeah, I, you know, with a 7.0 earthquake in a shallow depth, uh, I would have expected more casualties, but again, in a sparsely populated area, um, could be I would expect in this part of China, I don't know much about this part of the world, so I, I don't know what their building construction styles are. Um, I don't know much about the subsurface geology, although I can see from the Google Earth that the epicenter was in the mountains. Uh, but in terms of these basins here, this looks like farming area here, agriculture. Uh, but there are some urban areas in here. Um, if we kind of get out here. Yeah, you know, there's, there's uh, populated areas in here but none of these look like you know huge cities with with millions of people so an interesting earthquake in an interesting part of the world um and there'll be more there'll be more during this year that might be somewhat like that so 
Uh, okay, so uh, we covered Iceland, we covered the China earthquake, and the other big thing is the announcement that many of you know, but some of you might not. Um, and so, again, I'm kind of new to the whole YouTube scene, um, but apparently when two people that have a YouTube channel and a YouTube following get together and do something, that's called a collab, like a collaboration. So I'm, I've, I've been made aware that this is actually a term in the YouTube community. I, I have not ever seen a co collab or collab, uh, collab, collaboration, because I just don't follow a lot of YouTube channels. I got my head in the sand in my little world. And so I've never actually seen that. But, um, but um, many of you might know who Nick Zentner is. He is a very prominent geologist. He works at Central Washington University. He has a, a very strong following on his YouTube channel. He is very prolific. He puts out all sorts of content. His content largely focuses on the Washington, Oregon, British Columbia area, Pacific Northwest, but they do deep dives. He brings in guest geologists. He does a great job. He has like a, a PBS show. He's super famous. He's all over the place. He's won awards. Um, he and I actually met in 2015 at a conference in Hell's Canyon. So that was my first time meeting him. And at the time, he didn't have the YouTube channel. I think he had, there were a couple little videos out there. Maybe he did have the YouTube channel, but it wasn't what it is today. Um, so I knew who he was a little bit. Uh, we got along great. Uh, and it, that was the only time we've actually met in person, face to face. But in the years since then, we've emailed from time to time. As I was kind of starting to put geology education onto my YouTube channel, I uh, contacted him at one point and was you know, I remember struggling with like, man, I've only got like 200 people following me. How do, how do you how do you build this? How do you get the word out? I felt like I was doing cool and interesting things. Um, so I turned to him to see if he would give me like a shout out, which he did. And that was very much appreciated. Anyway, long story short, um, on Sunday the 4th, so that's a week from this coming Sunday, at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, which I believe is 5 p.m. Uh, GMT or UTC, I will be a Nick on, or I will, be, I will be a guest on his live stream. He's doing this Ice Age Floods A to Z series where they do a deep dive into all sorts of interesting aspects and stories about the Ice Age floods, mainly looking at the Missoula floods that occurred in northern Idaho, Washington, and down the Columbia and into British Columbia a little bit as well. Uh, so he's doing all sorts of great work with that. Um, but I will actually be on to talk about the Bonneville flood, which was another Ice Age flood in a different location. And I often talk about the Bonneville flood as being the quote unquote, the other flood or the forgotten flood, because the Missoula flood gets so much attention and it should, it was a fantastic event. There's some great history of evidence there. Um, there's, there's a lot to study and unpack there, but I feel like the Bonneville flood is sort of the one, you know, like the ugly stepsister that got you know, kind of beaten down and bullied or something. It just doesn't get as much attention as, as I'd like it to receive. So um, that's all I know. That's what we're supposed to talk about. He hasn't, I'm sure b between now and then he'll get, get with me and we'll have more of a outline fleshed out. But just want to make you aware of that. So if you want to catch me at that time, that will be on his YouTube channel. I might see if we can broadcast it to both, although I don't know exactly how to do that. So I'll look and see what we can do there. So anyway, just want to make you aware of that. Some of you might find that interesting. So there you go. Good stuff. All right. Um, okay. Now with all my slides exhausted, I can now turn to the questions you guys have posed. So let me come in here and see. Oh, I do have one question I want to start with first. But Susan has sent me uh, a couple of questions here. But first, I had a viewer email me a question. Let me close my windows down here. Give me a second. Um, here we go. And so I wanted to address her question. So this is from Connie, 
Um, let me make that a little bit bigger for you guys so you can kind of read along with me and then we'll go through her question. So Connie asked me, um, I have a question that was never able to get into a live chat. You've talked about the new land the lava creates and the pressure it puts on the surface where it lays. My questions are how much does a cubic meter or however they measure it of lava weigh? Is there such a thing as PSI for lava? And what does this additional weight mean if it's over an underground chasm chamber, etc.? So um, <laughs> to answer a question, I, I, I did the math. I think I got it right, but I'm trusting that some of you will follow this and make sure I didn't screw anything up. Um, so a cubic meter of lava, of basaltic lava, um, weighs about 2,900 kilograms, okay? Now, this is a huge, there's actually a range of, of density values for basaltic lava. And we've made the assumption here that this is dense rock. Obviously, when you're looking at fresh lava, it has a lot of gas bubbles in it. It can be very frothy. There's a lot of variables there. So this is, we're, we're erring on the very dense side of the equation. Um, but there was the number I, I, that I found pretty quickly. So... Here we go. We're going to do math. We're going to do math in front of 2,000 people, and it's going to be great because math is how we solve a lot of problems. So the density of lava is about 2,900 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, um, and there it is in there it is written out. Average density 2.9 grams per cubic centimeter, or 2,900 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, and I will try to throw the pounds in there as well for my my American friends. Now, so that's the density. That's one thing we need. The other thing we need to know is the volume of lava. And, and since she asked, I assume she might be interested in the lava field from January 14th. So there was a map that was put out that showed the thickness of that lava field. And it varied. There were places where the lava stacked up thick, other places where it was much thinner. I just, for simplicity's sake, picked an average thickness of about five meters. Okay, that's maybe a little bit on the thicker side but let's just go with it for now. We're just looking for a ballpark number. That's what she was asking. Uh, the area of the lava field, map view, looking down on it, that's been calculated and published, and that was about 0.68 uh, square kilometers. So we want our units to all be the same. So I had to turn uh, square kilometers into square meters. So that equals 680,000 square meters. And so if you take 680,000 square meters, times it by five meters, so we're taking the area and timesing it by the thickness, that will give you the volume. So the total volume of lava estimated during that eruption on January 14th was about 3.4 cubic, 3.4 million cubic meters of lava. Okay, just ballpark number. So um, now what we need to do is use our little density equation. Density is mass divided by volume. So if you rearrange the equation, you get if we're solving for mass, that's what she wants to know is how much it weighs. She wants to know the mass. Mass equals density times volume. Um, so the mass, we're figuring out the mass. We have to take the density that was given above, 2,900 kilograms per cubic meter, times it by the, the volume, 3.4 million cubic meters of lava in that lava field. Uh, and that gives us this big, huge whopping number of, I guess, what is that, 9.8 billion kilograms or if you want to be in pounds that's 21.7 billion pounds now it's likely way less than that because there's so much gas trapped in the rock right all the bubbles all the the pore spaces with the gas i wouldn't be surprised if it was like half of that but at least that gives you a, a ballpark number so connie i answered part of your question I maybe didn't answer all of that uh, what does the additional weight mean if it's over an underground chasm or chamber I don't think it has any bearing I think the additional weight of one lava field at least of this size sitting on top of a underground magma chamber that's five kilometers down it doesn't even know that that extra weight is there so anyway good stuff good question uh, from Connie and hopefully that was helpful so let me switch over now to oh that's still Connie's question let's get rid of that um, so Susan has sent me some of the questions through email. So thank you again to Susan for aggregating that and being our moderator. Uh, she's, she's the hero here, friends. She's doing the, 
the yeoman's work behind the scenes. I'm just, I'm just the talking head, which we've got enough of those in the world, right? Um, okay, ooh, kind of in purple there. Didn't expect that, Susan. That's fancy. All right. Uh, okay, and I'll try to get through as many of these as, as we can here. Tricky. Is there precedence of geothermal spots shifting place or disappearing after significant activity? I'm thinking of the Blue Lagoon where it might still run into trouble later. Um, yeah, geothermal, pla geothermal areas, areas that have hot groundwater, can absolutely change over time. They're incredibly dynamic. Um, it brings to mind the first thing I thought of, as may maybe many of you did as well, was I thought of Yellowstone. And there are places in Yellowstone where even in our lifetimes, easily, historically, we have seen areas of geyser and hot spring activity basically run dry. And other places where there used to be a forest start to become active. Uh, and if you get on the, the uh, USGS, they have an observatory, of course, at Yellowstone. And you dig into some of their past weekly articles they publish, there is... Um, some of that there. Now, that being said, let's remember that the Blue Lagoon is not a natural hot spring. The Blue Lagoon is where the geo hot geothermal water that is pumped to the surface at the nearby power plant, after they process that water to generate electricity, that's where the effluent water is pumped, is out into that lava field where it mostly sits on the ground, percolates probably very slowly downward, and people go and soak in it because it's a pretty blue color. So um, are we worried about the Blue Lagoon drying out or getting hotter or people being boiled alive in their Speedos and swimsuits? No, because it's a shallower system. But basically to have that happen at the Blue Lagoon, you would need to have the magma and the lava erupting more or less at the surface in the Blue Lagoon. So, and I think by that point, there'd be enough signs that like, oh gee, we need to get out of here if you were in the Blue Lagoon. So hopefully that was helpful for that question. Um, from Lor Mo question, I've been following the DAS data stream from the Blue Lagoon. Do you use this data when looking at all the data points regarding earth movement? Um, I haven't looked at that. I think that's the data stream. They just put that in around no in November when a lot of this stuff was happening. Um, I don't. I'm not a geophysicist. I'm not a seismologist. Um, so part of it's my limitations on being able to read some of those uh, more complicated seismograms. So I'm not, I'm not looking at that. And I wonder, I don't want to say that, but yeah, I don't, I don't have enough bandwidth to, to look at all the data that's out there. And I get so, I get a lot of emails from viewers that, that are sending me different things and and I try to look at them all, but it's 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 bandwidth and information overload. So, but if I if my job was to monitor this this volcano, this uh, this area, then yeah, you'd want to look at all the available data there. So, so yeah, I, I I don't look at that, but it's probably still valuable data. I just haven't had a chance to learn how to read it very well. Uh, is it true that the western part of Grindavik is moving northwest and the rest is moving? east yes in, in general we're seeing um movement oh now we need to go back to iceland goodbye china farewell uh in general the let's put the grobbins back up that'll be helpful um we see and let's put the gps stations on there too in general most of these stations you see let's switch the view a little bit sorry most of these stations on the in the western side are moving uh, slightly to the northwest. Let me finish the question, though. Um, all all rift is moving. Um, well, the plates are separating, right? And that's accommodated by the faults. It's more complicated than just one crack and two sides of the crack moving apart. It's usually a series of structures of faults and fractures that are accommodating the bulk motion. The the rifts or the faults don't always have to be aligned. They can be offset. I, I need to finish this question. Um, deformation station BLAL, the Blue Lagoon one, doesn't show on the map above the charts. It seems very concerning. And I think it's somewhere near at the Blue Lagoon. How can I confirm the location of this? 
Um, so great question. I think you can get into the so the station this person's asking about is one that I think they just added once all the chaos started. So if you look at this station here, notice there's no data until mid-November or so, or late November. Um, and then we see it rise, December 18th eruption. We see it rise, January 14th eruption. Um, I think they're asking where this station is located. And I think if you dig uh, into this site somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but if you go into the Institute of Earth Sciences, I think you can get the locations of the GPS stations in there. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful. Um, Paul P, is it going towards the power plant? Um, shoot, now I don't know the context of your question. So I'll move on. Sorry about that, Paul. Uh, Professor Thor Thorderson suggests the Robber faults at the coast had seawater in them. What will happen if the magma collides with this water for Grindavik? Thanks. Um, yeah, so if the, if well, the faults can go into the water, but the only place we're going to run into trouble is if the magma propagates down these graben or rift systems and erupts and comes up into the seawater. And if magma and water, whether it's seawater or freshwater, mix, uh, it's a very typically very explosive reaction. Um, the water is flashed into steam. That's an expansion process. The lava is basically blown into little tiny particles of ash and clots of lava that would rain down on the area there. Um, but, I mean, it's a locally explosive event, so it's not going to affect, for the most part, it really shouldn't affect air traffic. Um, it might not even, it might be a better scenario, and I talked about this in weeks past as well for Grindavik because if you built up a cone offshore of tephra of ash and you blanket some of the houses with ash maybe that's a better outcome than lava incinerating and burning those buildings um, yeah good question um, oh boy are these all <clears throat> all the same questions why doesn't it erupt from the exact same place because um, conduits of magma they're not very wide and after they erupt they can cool over time, it doesn't take that long if it's narrow, um, and then the magma finds a new pathway out. And usually, too, I didn't mention this, but once once magma starts to cool, it can reach a certain temperature where it's not totally solidified, but it's it's a little bit um, ductile, so it, it behaves maybe like silly putty, maybe that's a good analogy. And it's actually harder to break through that material than it is to break through completely solidified lava. So lava that's completely solidified or rock that's sitting above the magma chamber is brittle. When you exert a force on it, it will eventually break. But you can get magma that's solidified to some degree, but not totally solidified. And it's actually harder to break through that. And that's one reason why the magma might go through in some different area there. Um, okay, why doesn't it erupt from, oh, that's the same question, from the excellent place where the crust is soft or weakened already? Uh, I think I can answer that. Would you expect from Edith, do you expect the next eruption to be further west than the previous? Sfart Sangi GPS station moved a lot to the north and west, so would there be a weakness? Well, I'm not worried about anything yet. Let's take these out, and let's take the grobbins out too for now. Um, I'm not concerned about an eruption in this area over here until we until we see earthquakes moving in that direction, until we see the magma pushing in and breaking the rocks. We have no evidence that the magma comes all the way over here to like the Elvorp craters. It could erupt through those, but we would need to see probably earthquake data and GPS data suggesting that the magma has moved into this region is breaking rock and pushing on the fractures over there. So that would be the indicator that the magma is moving off to the west. And that's what we would ideally want, right? Like if we're if we're concerned about the town, let's have that magma move over here somewhere, flow down to the coastline. Um, you know, there's maybe a couple farms here, but not a whole lot of infrastructure. There's one road and that's m more uh, desirable than, than running through town there potentially. 
Uh, I read an article that Mars soil could be more fertile than Earth's. Is that even possible with the amount of radiation it's getting? Oh boy, I don't know enough about that to know for sure. That would be a good question for a planetary geologist or a soil scientist. Um, sorry, I can't answer that. Paul, would you personally feel comfortable going to the Lagoon within the next week or month? Um, I've been to Iceland four times. I've never been to the Blue Lagoon, <laughs> um, but that's me. Uh, I enjoy sitting in a hot spring outside as much as the next person. But what I don't like are crowds, and that is by far the cr most crowded place in Iceland, I think. Um, and so I've never had the desire to go there. It's big. It's a big kind of luxury spa. It's just not my scene. That being said, if someone gave me a free ticket to the Blue Lagoon and I was there, would I feel comfortable being there for a couple hours on a day? Probably. Yeah. You know, I, would I want to stay there overnight at their hotel? Probably not. That probably, um, I don't think I would feel comfortable with that. So just just my opinion, though. This this comes back to the notion we talked about before of risk and acceptable risk. Is there risk at the Blue Lagoon? Absolutely. You're very close to an active magma chamber and geologic system. Is the risk acceptable? Might be. For me, it's acceptable to go there for a couple hours, half a day. I feel I probably feel pretty comfortable with that. For other people, they'd say, no way, no how. Other, another person might say, yeah, I'll stay there for three weeks if you give me a good deal. So it's all about acceptable risk. Um, what about the void spaces that might exist under the town? Do they have a plan to try to map that? Um, I did think, I, I thought I heard something about them using GPR, ground penetrating radar, to map out some of the void spaces. You got the town on top. There's some cracks that are known. But at this point, there's been so much damage um, that there could be larger void spaces under the town. And so there's some concern about that. They need to obviously figure out where those are and collect that data. Uh, and so that would be part of that process. So um, let me check the next batch coming from Susan. And I think this will be it. So Susan, please don't send me a third batch. I think we'll just do two, two batches for today. All right. Um, what am I doing here? I'm trying to make it bigger. Oh, down here. There we go. All right. Elaine Jones. Hi, Elaine. The latest fissure near town appears to be at the intersection of two of those faults. Coincidence. Um, yeah. So I think she's talking about the latest fissure in town. Well, there's the two. The Grobbins intersect up here by the greenhouse. Let me go back to her question so I make sure I got it. Here's be at the intersection of two of those faults. Coincidence? Probably not. Um, and this is highly simplified, right? So this is just showing the large faults associated with the two Grobbins. There's likely some subparallel faults that uh, are near these as well. Um, I know there's one that runs right through this part of town because this is close to Amanda Joe's house. So it, this is the sports complex and swimming pool here. Um, so I think one of the big ones runs through this area. So that crack now seems to be related to um, the development of this this side or this margin, the eastern side of this grob in here. So uh, I hope that addressed that, Elaine. Thanks for your question. Christopher, as the Graben continues to subside around Goodindivik, is there a near-term risk that the sea harbor will flood the city and go further inland? Or also could the sea flood the cracks and lava tubes? Yeah, I think what we're seeing now, um, and I heard one of the Icelandic geologists comment, I, I don't know where the data is for this, so I'll just I'll just say what, what I heard him say and but I but I don't I don't know this myself. He and this was uh, Professor Thordelson said that these grobins are pre-existing structures, that they were there before the town was there, and that they've just been reactivated by some of the activity here. That may be true. Um, as I drew these lines on my Google Earth, I looked hard at, like, before the blue lines went on there, I looked to see, um, you know, like, is there any anything in the topography that looks like these lines are following? And I really didn't see anything. But it does it does look... It's curious that this eastern Graben coincides nicely with the harbor, suggesting that there's this natural embayment, this water body, uh, the sea comes into the land to this degree because possibly it was a low-lying area. So there may be something to that. I just don't know 
where he's getting that direct data. So, um, so I can't really speak to that. Um, yeah, hopefully I answered the question. The Grobman continues to subside. Yeah, so I think so. I think if 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 the Grobman continues to subside, you could end up with some localized flooding around these coastal areas. Now, luckily, as you just move, you know, a few blocks or streets inland from the harbor, um, the elevation rises. I mean, by the time you're over here, you're up almost 40 feet, 12 meters, whatever, 13 meters. Uh, above sea level and it's unlikely that anytime soon you'd have so much subsidence in the Graben that you'd actually see the sea level come up that high but possibly um, yeah good question there all right next one from Charles oh that was Charles question oh let's see it looks like Christopher and Charles are the same so Johans or Joanne sorry having a hard time reading this purple diagram the chief volcanologist said today that the Grobbins are not new, that they've been there for a long time. Yeah, so I watched his little interview, and that's 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 what I just mentioned. They've sunk more, though, with the recent eruptions, though, right? I saw him say that. I'm not refuting his statement at all. I just don't know what evidence or data he's looking at that, that leads him to that conclusion. Um, if we knew there was a Grobbin already there, why wasn't it mapped and made known? Or is he saying that the Graben, that because of the activity we've had over the last three months, that we're now seeing these structures have been reactivated? I would just want to see what the evidence is that suggests that these were pre-existing structures that have been reactivated. And I don't, I haven't seen that yet. So, but one of the problems of being a geologist in Idaho, or like a long ways away. Uh, would Sean consider commenting, this is from Hazel, on the new USGS map of active volcanic areas on Earth? Oh boy, well I probably need to see that map and I don't know, oh I think I know what she's talking about. I did see something about that, but I didn't, look, so I saw it like in like a, like a news type thing, um, but I didn't look at it in much detail. But let's look at it now because that's got me excited now. Uh, was it a hazard map? I think it was a hazard map. Um, let's try a new volcanic hazard map. Is it in here? Some of you are shouting at me on the live chat. It's right here. Uh, or if someone could throw the link up to it, that would be great. I do have my live chat open, so I could go to that so if that but yeah I did see that so hopefully this will open and uh, I'm not patient so I'm going to just jump over here well now I've got two two wheels spinning let's kill some of these I guess yeah we'll probably kill that one um, is anyone no, no one's put it in. Uh, I was hoping someone knows what she's talking about. The new, the, the USGS just released a new um, volcanic hazard map for the US. And that is what this question deals with. They wanted my comment on it. And I know it wasn't an interactive map like this. It was like a published map. View assessments. The new USGS volcanic activity map. Do I need to put that into the search bar? Uh, maybe. We'll just try one more time. We don't need to belabor this too much, I suppose. Activity map. Maybe we can look for it this way. Here we go. Maybe. Here we go. Oh, that's earthquakes. Rats. Was it an earthquake one or was it a was it a volcanic one? She did say here that it was yeah, active volcanic areas oh on earth. Oh, maybe that's something else. Maybe I saw this is what I saw. I apologize. So this was the new thing that came out uh just the last week or so, new USGS map showing earthquake hazards. So I have not seen the volcanic one. I don't see anyone sending me a link, so we'll move on and I'll apologize um, 
Hazel for that, sorry. From Dan Cooper, is it true that the Icelandic government is going to buy out all the homeowners in town? That's what I've heard. I don't know how or how that's going to work, but that's, it's at least being discussed. I don't know if it's been decided yet. Um, and Amanda Jo would be much better than I would about giving you, I could be about giving you good information on that. So, um, yeah, that's the trick, right? Like, I think the insurance payment kicks in if your house is destroyed. So those three people who lost their homes are probably in the process of being compensated somehow. But how does it work when you still have a home that maybe isn't even damaged? You're nowhere near the cracks in town, but you're sort of in this geologic, you're in the crosshairs of this volcano. Um, I'm not sure how that works. So, uh, Paul, any truth in the rumor that the Icelandic government, yeah, considers a buyout? Same question, same answer. Uh, ghost, hello, Sean, I have a question for you. Can this situation get worse? Um, I think it's maybe... I mean, anything could be worse, right? Like, you know, we could, but in the realm of reality and, and, and the geologic system and the um, the situation we've been dealt in terms of the geology here, for the town, I think months, if not years, of this thing, kind of situation playing out is probably the worst thing to happen. Um, you know, obviously, if the lava flows into town and destroys everything, that might be considered worse now. But it also means, OK, there's there's a finality, there's closure. This town doesn't exist anymore. And now we all need to pick up and move on to the next chapter in our lives. So it's a tough question to answer. That's just some thoughts there. Um, can you add a link of your video about that Hawaii event, please? Um, yeah, all I really had there, I did a bunch of videos this last May in Hawaii when I was there with my students, and I did one in particular right over the lava channel that was pretty cool. I could probably pull that up quickly, and maybe I'll just paste it in the chat. Does that sound is that doable? Um, so let's do that real quick. And so here's me. Uh, got to go to the playlist. We're doing a live stream. If we go to Hawaii, and and I've thought about re relaunching some of these. Some of these didn't get a lot of views. Um, Might have been the way I kind of promoted them or whatever. Others, I don't know. So some of these I might relaunch at some point in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that into the chat for that person if they want it. So there it is. Um, yeah, or because I now I'm realizing it might kind of disappear in the chat, or if you just go to Hawaii um, and then in the playlist and then look for the, um, I think I called it huge channel or immense channel. I put some cool clickbaity term on it, which I hate doing, but yeah. Okay, so some of these questions I think are going with when I was talking to you through the situation in Hawaii and at the Kapoho tide pools. Would lava filling tide pools area create marine fossils actually it was a it was a a kind of tragedy an ecosystem collapse i suppose there was really sad reports and i don't want to get too graphic or whatever here um a lot of those marine creatures near the kapoho tide pools died um, as the lava went into the ocean the chemistry of the water became uh, very acidic i believe the water temperature increased quite a bit and there were uh, dead sea turtles and fish and obviously there's things like coral that can't really move out of the way but there was um, actually quite a bit of um, deceased marine biota like floating out there uh, for a number of days or weeks so uh, kind of sad um, I think that was the last question on that so thanks for sending those to me Susan um and let me see real quick here if there's anything else i don't think susan sent me anything else let me check over here i think i got to the two batches of questions so that's good i can quickly scroll through the chat and see if anything else shows up that i can address um is there a risk of sulfur dioxide entering a blue lagoon given the amount of activity in the area? That's from Scotty. I don't think so, not right now. Um, again, the, the magma body's five kilometers down. 
it has found a pathway presumably horizontally and then vertically over to this area here uh, we have no reason at this time to believe that magma is moving straight up into the Blue Lagoon power plant area. Um, and so, no, there's, there's no volcanic gases being emitted anywhere around that there. So it seems to be okay for now, but obviously stay tuned. Um, from Helena, what are your thoughts on the Icelandic glacier volcano and the two strange sinkholes? Uh, I saw a little bit about that. That's uh, the volcano over here. We talked a little bit about it when it had the glacial flood. This is uh, Glimsvot in this area. <clears throat> and I think they detected more sinkholes. Remember, there's a what's called a, what do they call it, a, a cauldron? Uh, basically, a, a subsidence or collapse feature on the glacier immediately over the volcanic vent and if I and I didn't read the whole article or anything but I think they had detected that those had gotten larger which indicates that there was a subglacial a bit of a subglacial eruption that melted some of the ice and caused it to collapse so um, very cool all right um, hopefully that was helpful and I'll be sure to go through the live chat later and see if I missed anything, uh, see if I did anything embarrassing. But want to quickly, again, thank Susan Helmer for being our moderator. It looks like she's done a great job of aggregating the questions, um, keeping people on topic. But you guys are usually all well behaved anyway, so I appreciate her help in moderating. Hope you guys enjoyed this live stream episode. Uh, moving forward. I don't know. We'll see when the next Iceland update will be. Today is Wednesday. Maybe this weekend I'll do one on Saturday or Sunday. Probably just a video version one, not a live stream. Uh, then next week we'll see how things progress. Might try to do another live stream. If not, you can catch me on the Nick Zentner um, live stream on February 4th. Other videos I have in the hopper. I believe tomorrow there's one coming out. What did I just get ready? Oh, it's an older video that I think most people missed. Uh, it's a really cool volcanic feature in southeastern Utah called a diatreme, uh, called the Mule Ear Diatreme. So if you're interested in that, that one will launch tomorrow. And I'll get another one ready for Friday or Saturday. Um, I've got so many still in the hopper and sort of relaunching some of the old ones that those in addition to these Iceland updates I, I think I've got plenty of content to push out you know four or five maybe six a week I don't know what the right number is maybe some of you are just soaking all this up maybe some of you are like hey slow down fella this is too much um, but hopefully you'll enjoy some of these other videos I also want to let you know I have the field trip April 12th and 13th here around southern Idaho so email me at um, Sean Wilsey at gmail.com if you are interested in those field trips by February by February or so I'll be putting out another announcement for some June field trips to the craters of the moon area and some other parts of south or central Idaho so look for those as well and then as we move into later summer and fall we'll, we'll see what else I can put together um, but I do enjoy getting together with you folks getting out in the field that's where I think the learning is almost even better and, to, and really kind of um, that's where the magic happens so to speak so thanks again appreciate all the people who click the like button um, all the people who subscribed Thanks again for joining me. I enjoyed spending time with you here, learning more about Iceland, talking about the earthquake in China, um, just spending some time with you here. So I appreciate all your participation. Have a great day. Be well. Thanks again to Susan. I'm sure I'll be talking to Amanda Joe soon, so we'll wish her well also. And take care. Have a great day.